You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. It's 11 o'clock at night. It's dark. You're sitting in front of the mirror getting ready for bed. There's nobody else in the house. You see something move in the corner of your eye. You glance to your right, but you don't see anything. Another minute goes by, and you think you see movement again. So you slowly turn to your left, but again, the room is empty. You turn back around, and staring you face to face in the mirror is a cat. You jump back, because you don't have a cat, and there's no cat in the room. But there he is, staring at you in the mirror. Welcome to Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week, we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Now, step into the supernatural world of pets with your Paranormal Pets ghostly host, Brandy Stark. Hello, and welcome to Paranormal Pets. My name is Brandy Stark, and for this week's episode, we are inspired by the recent episodes featured on Discovery Shark Week, and we're going to take a look at sharks in the supernatural. We'll get started right after these messages. Now, time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. Pet Life Radio, the number one pet radio network on the planet, joins forces with iHeartRadio to put the power of your pets in your pocket. Awesome. Download the iHeartRadio app and rock Pet Life Radio on your phone, on your tablet, on your Xbox, in your car. Pet talk, pet tunes, and fun pet times. Pet Life Radio and iHeartRadio. Positively possum. It's dinner time in America where more pet parents trust PetSmart for natural and expert-recommended foods than any place else. And now, we've added more than 100 new varieties to our already wide selection of your favorite brands, like Simply Nourish, Authority, Wellness, Science Diet, and more. Do what's best for your pet. At PetSmart, happiness in store. Go to PetSmartDeal.com to find out this week's coupon code and save up to 30% on food, treats, toys, and more. And get free shipping on orders of $49. Go to PetSmartDeal.com. P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host, Brandy Stark. And welcome back to Paranormal Pets. I'm your host, Brandy Stark, and we are looking at sharks and the supernatural. The whole reason that I started with this line of thought is that one recent episode featured on Monster Hammerhead this past week, which was on Discovery, featured a local folkloric urban legend from the Tampa Bay area. We'll start with that as our launching place, and then we'll kind of move on and take a look at how sharks uh, show up in religion and or popular culture, and then I'll let you make up your own mind. Personally, I do think that sharks are a little bit malaligned. I do find that rather interesting because they are such an important part of our ecosystem. All right, so part of the additional inspiration came from an August 9th, 2014 article entitled Search for Old Hitler Brings Hammerhead Hunt to Nearby Gulf. That comes from the St. Petersburg Tribune, an offshoot of the Tampa Tribune. And the article is by Walt Belcher, a Tribune correspondent. He's also a very well-known writer in this area. Uh, he gets a lot of really quirky articles and columns, so it's, uh, it's pretty neat that he wrote this. 
Massive hammerhead sharks have been spotted and caught in the Gulf waters between Naples and Tampa Bay for over a century, but one ornery, impossible to catch creature has become a legend. Fish tales have been passed down for decades about an elusive 25 foot long great hammerhead that is bigger than a pickup truck and covered with battle scars from encounters with boat bottoms, propellers, harpoons, countless fish hooks, and even a machete. Nicknamed Old Hitler, this hammerhead would be more than 70 years old if all the stories were true and all were about the same shark. He is Florida's version of the Loch Ness Monster, said J. Scott Butheris, an outdoor writer for the Naples Daily News, who is featured on a new documentary, Monster Hammerhead, debuting during the annual Shark Week on Discovery. Butheris, 33, who was born and raised in Port Charlotte, has heard stories about Old Hitler since he was a kid hanging around his grandmother's bait shop. As an adult, he has researched and documented stories about this mythical shark. This granddaddy of all hammerheads, according to the stories, has broken 400-pound fishing leads, almost jumped into boats to steal tarpon off hooks as the fish were being hauled in, and chased fishing boats to steal dead stingrays being used for chum. One story attributes old Hitler with dragging a jeep off a bridge after snagging the vehicle's tow winch, which had been tossed into the water. The shark had never harmed any humans, but he scared a few folks. It's such a great piece of Florida folklore that it's fitting that he's being featured during during Shark Week. And we'll just snip a little bit to some of the legends. The old Hitler nickname came about during World War II when German U-boats were attacking American ships off the Florida coast. The United States Coast Guard and Navy used blimps to try and spot these submarines. Many reported sightings turning out to be a big hammerhead or big hammerheads swimming near the surface. And the old Hitler reference to Adolf Hitler stuck. And then the legend grew with the shark's exploits getting more and more outlandish. Now, just as an aside, if you do not know, this was a very serious issue in the state of Florida during World War II. Uh, there were actually a couple of instances of U-boats being captured off the coast and of German spy cells and I believe sleeper cells that infiltrated the United States through Florida. I believe there was also a German prison camp in Florida for prisoners of war. So, I mean, it's Florida was very much involved with this, and I have met folks in this area who do remember, you know, having to scan the coast, volunteering to scan the coast for enemy planes, etc. So, it's kind of interesting that this does tie into World War II. Interestingly enough, and before we get back to the legend, the shark stories kind of begin to pop up again in the 1970s. So they may start in World War II, and then you kind of end up with the second generation uh, of people who grew up with this legend really bringing it back out. Now, of course, the other thing that came out in the 1970s was Jaws. So it kind of makes some sense that this urban legend would resurrect itself during that time period. Okay, so additional stories here according to this article. People even claim they saw old Hitler with a scar on his head that resembled the Nazi swastika. Popular local TV and radio outdoor celebrity Salty Soul and Captain Mel Berman kept the legend going with old Hitler reports from anglers. While it's unlikely that all stories involve the same shark, the existence of a 20-foot-long great hammerhead that can do this kind of damage is within the realm of possibility, Butheris said, which is a little scary, perhaps. Hammerheads feed on tarpon and stingrays that gather along the Gulf Coast in spring and summer. The sharks frequent the waters from the Sunshine Skyway to Boca Grand Pass. Since the turn of the century, there have been reports of fishermen landing 20-foot-long hammerheads weighing more than a ton. The hammerheads were thought to live about 20 to 30 years, but scientists found one estimated to be 49 years old. Since the International Game Fish Association started keeping world records, the biggest hammerhead caught was in 2008 at 13 feet 6 inches long and 1,360 pounds. Uh, hammerheads are rarely a threat to humans, said underwater photographer and shark expert Joe Romero. Actually, the great hammerheads are facing extinction because of their limited diets, which limit their food Food supplies. Now, as an aside to that, I do find it rather interesting because old Hitler is said to be 20 to 25 feet long, 2,000 pounds in weight, and yet really they haven't found hammerheads in this area any greater than 12 feet. I had actually heard 
Not only was there a swastika birthmark or scar on the forehead, but I had actually heard that, because this is an urban legend or folklore, so a lot of this is spoken, years ago, that, what was it, that there were some Nazi soldiers in Florida that had somehow captured the shark. And I can't remember how they did that, because that would be a really ginormous shark. And they carved a swastika into its dorsal fin. And because they did this, the shark gained like these odd supernatural powers and a very mean, evil spirit that, of course, perpetuated with the ideas of World War II of the enemy other. And uh, so this shark, uh, you know, had this supernatural story to begin with. So that's just kind of a fun connection to our own area. And I thought uh, it might be a good lead into what we might talk about here today. So, so we have our lovely hammerhead legend locally. And again, I do like this article because it refutes some of the unfortunate ideas that come with sharks. But... Uh, When it comes to sharks and the supernatural, it's a little bit harder to find a lot of things. The Olmec people do appear to have had a fish or shark monster god figure. It was recognizable with the shark's tooth, and the head had a crescent-shaped eye and a small lower jaw, which was supposed to kind of indicate the notion of the shark. Basically, when they they portrayed the entire figure of uh, this god, and we don't really seem to have a name for it, but the god would have crossed hands, a dorsal fin, and a split tail as part of his, of his appearance. Now, years ago, again in Florida, they did find something called, which was kind of tongue-in-cheek called the Miami Circle. This in and of itself was supposed to have these supernatural connections to Stonehenge, which did not really pan out. It was just kind of this interesting side folklore that I researched back in the day. But uh, one of the stones in the what's supposed to be a really ancient Native American worship center found, it's kind of found in the... um, the delta area of where a river connects to the ocean in South Florida. But it actually did have, again, one of these crescent-shaped eyes that many people at one point connected to representing the shark and that the shark would have been a, a supernatural entity even for folks in Florida. So we'll kind of continue on along these ideas shark collars. Now this gets to be kind of interesting. When we deal with shark gods, there are not a lot of legends, but the legends we find, of course, relate to oceanic mythology. So one group that is fairly popular and actually has some rather unusual history to it is Fiji. The Fiji Islands have their own shark god, whose name is, let's see if I can say this, Duka Wakwa who's an angry, fearless, headstrong, and jealous god. He was not a friendly guy. And he was the guardian of the reef entrance of the island. So he is quite a sacred guy. He had the ability to transform into a shark, and he would oftentimes go out and patrol the reef, but he was not friendly to the other species that were there. And interestingly enough, he aggravated another god, uh, Kadavu, who was an octopus, and the octopus actually went after the shark. So if you have seen any of those horrible B, C, or D rated movies from sci-fi, I think they actually did have shark versus octopus as one of these, but that actually may be based on something that did according to legend, happened. So there was a great battle between the octopus and the shark, but no matter how much the shark fought, it could not shake the octopus. So finally he gave up, and the octopus said that he would release the shark if the shark would stop being so nasty and angry, and if he would stop harassing all the octopus in the reef, and if he would stop bothering the rest of the reef-based animals. So it's kind of interesting because Dekua Kwa, 
And again, I apologize if I'm completely mispronouncing that, and I probably am, but he started to protect the reef and the creatures. This is where he really transforms. But then he also begins to protect the divers and the shark feeders. And because of this, the Fiji fishermen still offer beverages, kind of a kava beverage, into the sea for the shark. And interestingly enough, kava is an herb that you can sometimes get through a health food store that's supposed to have calming elements. So I think that's kind of interesting. That's a really interesting drink to give to an angry shark god, something to keep you calm, keep your mind focused on guarding the people, and allow you to return back. Now, New Guinea is a second place that actually has some rather interesting shark practices and I think we'll get to those. They're actually known as shark collars right after these messages. Now time for something really scary. A word from our sponsors. Paranormal pets will reappear before you can say Bigfoot. Don't run away. Dogs leave fur wherever they go. It collects all over the home. There are many tools designed to stop dog hair spreading, but their effectiveness varies, and afterwards you have to clean the tool, then the floor. With the Dyson Groom Tool, you simply deploy the bristles, then gently brush the coat. Loose fur is removed, while dead skin and allergens are captured by the vacuum. And to clean up, you simply release the trigger. To get this awesome Dyson Groom Tool, go to DysonDeals.com. That's DysonDeals.com. Hi, this is T.O.D. Anderson, and I'm the host of Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. We're going to talk about a variety of topics on canine behavior and training, all based on modern methods that are fun for you and your dog. We might be talking about other critters, too. So join us on Get Positive Results. We'll talk about common issues between you and your dog, answer your questions, discuss different activities you can do with your dog, and keep you posted on current canine news and products. All this on Get Positive Results on Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Did you hear that? Our commercials have mysteriously disappeared. Paranormal Pets is back with our haunted host, our ghost host, Brandy Stark. And welcome back. We are taking a look at shark collars. This is actually from a website on the Huffington Post or Huff Post based on religion. And if you're interested, it is HuffingtonPost.com. Shark-collars-photos will probably find it for you. The article is actually an excerpt from The Demon Fish Travels Through the Hidden World of Sharks by Juliet Illiparin. In a world where most humans view sharks with a mix of fear and loathing, Papua New Guinea is one of the few places where people embrace them. For the villagers in Tembin, Messi, and Kantu, the three towns that still practice shark calling, sharks are an integral part of their creation story, a religious faith that has endured for centuries. At this point, many Papua New Guineans see shark calling as a divine right, one of the few skills they boast that no other civilization can offer. They argue that their ability to lure sharks from the deep and catch them by hand using snares represents a unique culture that should not be snuffed out by either colonialization or modernization. Just because outsiders might not understand their practices, they say, doesn't mean it lacks value. And so what they actually do, they interview Aluda Toksoko. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly either. But he is a veteran shark caller who basically, they say he goes out regularly in search of sharks. In any given season, he may go out to the sea 30 times. He was 30 when he first learned shark calling. By practicing the same rituals as those before him, he sees himself as a sort of shark tamer who calls upon his ancestors for aid in order to corral such a fierce predator. Even with his frizzy white hair and well-lined visage, uh, he's an impressive figure, lean and ready for battle. The shark callers basically, to summarize, they go out into the water and with 
really no weapons or anything else. They capture sharks by hand. It is said that uh, they are supreme in their sense of confidence and um, basically this individual that they interviewed, uh, he goes into a canoe and he has a special instinct poised to catch a shark for, in this point, the first time this season. He lures the shark to his outrigger canoe. He subdues the fish by hand. Uh, shark calling is practiced in three sets of islands. And it's kind of interesting to trap a shark. The collar submerges a noose made of plated cane, which is attached to a wooden propeller float. When the shark is through the noose up to its pectoral fin, the fisherman jerks up on the handle, which tightens the noose around the shark, and the shark collar must resist the animal's force to attempt to break free. Uh, once the shark is exhausted, the fisherman can relax for a few moments and let the float bring it to the surface. And unfortunately, in this religious practice, the shark is sacrificed. They do kill it. But it's still kind of interesting. Uh, it's part of the supernatural elements that we will find with uh, indigenous cultures. Okay, in Hawaii, it's kind of interesting because Hawaiian mythology is very unique, very complex, and ancestors and gods are somewhat interchangeable. So the spirit of a, a deceased ancestor becomes or could become a deity, fairly similar to, let's say, like a Kachina type figure, not 100% on target, but kind of in that school. So essentially, the guardian spirit continues to give warnings of disaster, destruction, guards those that guard its bones, if you will, protects its descendants. And if somebody is really deserving, then they will also help an individual. From a website entitled Shark Gods, and it's from sharkmans-world.eu backslash gods.html. We get a story. Mary Kawena Pukui, a reverend scholar of Hawaiian culture who died in 1986 at the age of 91, explained that as gods and relatives in one, these ancestor spirits give us strength when we are weak, warning when we're in danger, guidance in our bewilderment, inspiration in our arts. They are equally our judges, hearing our words and watching our actions, reprimanding us for error and punishing us for blatant offenses. These ancestor spirits can manifest in nature. A shark, a sea turtle, a hawk, a lizard, an owl, or any other animal, plant, or mineral. Members of the family were said to recognize these ancestor spirits no matter what form it chose, whether it be an insect on land, a crab in the ocean, etc. These ancestors might appear in a dream to furnish guidance. When a fisherman or craftsman was especially successful, credit was given to the spirit for imparting the mana or power that enabled the earthly being to develop such skill. If you believed that your ancestors were appearing as a certain type of animal, then you did not eat that animal, just so you know. Further down on the site, we do find a story from the Cook Islands, Legend of Ina and the Shark. And it's kind of an interesting story. Apparently, this was popular enough that they issued the story as part of their banknotes in October of 1992. Ina was the love of Tinaru, a god of the ocean who lived on a floating island. One day, Ina jumped into the sea in search of her love, but since the sea was so big, she was continually tossed back to the shore by its gigantic waves. She enlisted in some fish to help her swim, but they were too small to carry her. So in her frustration, she beat them with a stick, permanently marking their bodies. This is how the angelfish got their black stripes. Eventually, a shark agreed to carry her on his back. For this journey, she took some coconuts with her for food and drink. After some time, Ina became thirsty, so the shark raised his dorsal fin so that she could crack a coconut and partake of its milk. This she did, and it satisfied her thirst. Then she relieved herself on the shark, who wasn't too happy about that, and warned her not to do this again. This is why islanders complain that the shark meat smells of urine. Well, that ought to stop you from eating any shark meat. 
Again, Ina became thirsty, and this time she cracked the coconut on the shark's head. One version of the story says that this is how the hammerhead shark came about. Another story says that this is why there is a bump on the shark's head, which to this day is called Ina's bump. Reeling from pain, the shark tossed Ina off his back, dived below the waters, leaving her to flounder in the sea. One version says he ate her, but that isn't the nicest end to this story. Finally, Takiya the Great, the king of all sharks, rose from the bottom of the sea and rescued Ina. He then carried her to Tinaru's island, where they were finally reunited. Boy, that woman was nothing but trouble, let me tell you. And the last little bit that I will leave you with, our own modern legends when it comes to sharks. Of course, I'm sure that many of you have seen Sharknado, and I'm sorry to say Sharknado too. I'm of a mixed mind on this because these movies are so obviously bad and contrived that there's no way that anybody could believe that they're real, but I find it very interesting that once again, the shark is portrayed as the ultimate bad guy. What can you do about it, you know? I just sincerely hope that we never have that kind of Sharknado. However, sci-fi, and tying to our supernatural myth, uh, mythology, and theme here, actually did create a movie called Ghost Shark. I do know some folks in the UK who saw it. I myself have not seen this, and I'm not sure who else has seen this, but from the IMDB database, here is our plot summary. When rednecks on a fishing trip kill a great white shark, its spirit comes back for revenge and soon turns its sights on the town of Smallport. Teenage Ava, her younger sister Cicely, and friend Blaze witness the start of the ghost shark's rampage, but the authorities don't believe their story. With the help of a crotchety lighthouse keeper named Finch, the teens discover that the spectral shark can hunt whenever there's water and that the town's dark past may provide the clues they need to defeat it. Apparently, there is no other synopsis for this, I know we're rating, which probably is a pretty bad sign. But if you'd like to follow up with that, do feel free to check out the IMDb database. And I do believe that it will show up in reruns. I lay odds that it'll show up in October fairly soon since Halloween's rolling around. And y'all can decide for yourselves. Ultimately, I have no desire to bother the sharks, to hunt a great white, or to take the chance on being haunted by a great white shark. I'm trying to figure how a ghost shark would actually eat you, but, um, you know, we shouldn't think too deeply into these things. So I hope you enjoyed this brief episode into sharks. If you happen to have any old Hitler stories that you'd like to pass along, I'd always like to uh, add to the Spirits of St. Petersburg Urban Legend Database, or you can look up the gentleman from the article and perhaps add to his database. I think it's quite fascinating. And if there are other shark stories out there, we'd love to hear them. Otherwise, the only other tidbits I have for you are to please remember to check your rescues. Locally, we have Pug Rescue of Florida, which is an organization that I certainly endorse, can always use help with finances, fosters, and folks to adopt. My own pugs are here with me tonight, so any background snores are coming from them. And they're actually being good. I'm not quite sure what this means. I better make sure there's no ghost sharks around. Also, if you're interested in uh, the Spirits of St. Petersburg, which does have links to pages on shadow animals, paranormal pugs, and stories based on pugs and ghosts, and a couple other links to animal-based ghost stories, feel free to check out www.spiritsofstpetersburg.com. Otherwise, uh, we'd love to hear from you on topics that you have interest in, and uh, I will do my best to research them and get them out there for you. I hope that you and yours are having a simply swimming time with all of this. Best of luck and keep on haunting. Pet Life Radio presents Paranormal Pets, where you can always expect the unexpected. Each week we'll discuss all aspects of weird or spiritual animal encounters, ghosts, totems, psychic animals, animal souls, animal angels, and animals in religion, with a little cryptozoology thrown in. Step into the supernatural world of pets every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>